Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream award-winning podcast. I'll put that right up front because this weekend I am flying to Denver, Colorado to attend the Coalition of Visionary Resources as this show is a finalist for Best Podcast. I'm so excited to go and attend. Wish me luck. And it's already been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award and listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. So thank you to the listeners for being a big part of where we are right now. And I also want to say thank you for being on this journey. As I was sharing with my amazing guest, who I'll introduce in a minute, I would do this no matter what, because this is a masterclass for me every week. And the fact that you guys show up to listen to it as well makes it even more meaningful. It makes it a really cool party. So a little bit later, I will be introducing you to my guest today. It's Dr. Joanna Kuyava, here to talk about her new book, and we'll be diving into if spirituality and sexuality can be experienced as one. I am hoping that the answer is a resounding yes, and we can learn way more. Uh, this show, thank you very much, is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. You could take their class anywhere globally, as well as become a facilitator. Go to Dr. Dane here, H E R dot com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger, and I help healers, entrepreneurs, speakers, coaches to write a highly engaging book. I am a book coach and uh, just got done teaching a beautiful book incubator for a few days so if you'd like to write a book you can join our ongoing book writing group at debbie-dashinger.com slash visible visionaries or if you'd like to learn how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results or all the tenants that it takes to be highly visible these days and that is so important and please, I urge you to go get your free gift, templates, videos, all the how-tos. It's at debbie-inger.com slash gift. And it's spelled D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. The question is, how is the lineage of the goddess now resurfacing in our collective experience of spirituality? My guest again is Dr. Joanna Kuyava, the author of The Other Goddess, Mary Magdalene, and The Goddesses of Eros and Secret Knowledge. She is a scholar and spiritual detective who received her BA and MA from the Pontifical Institute for Medieval St Studies in Canada. And Joanna got her PhD from Monash, University in Australia. As an active academic for over 20 years, Joanna uses her scholarly training to investigate spirituality and sexuality topics. Writing for academic publications on spiritual travel, plus has had her short stories and essays published in various media and prestigious anthologies, including Best Australian Stories, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, She Rises. Dr. Kuyava is on the editorial board of the International Journal of Goddess Studies. And you can find out more about her, go to her name. And it's Joanna with two N's, J-O-A-N-N-A-K-U-J-A-W-A.com. And with that, I welcome Joanna to the Dare to Dream show. It's so great to have you. It's wonderful to be here with you, Debbie, and congratulations on being a finalist for, you know, such a prestigious award. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I loved your book and I was telling you so timely. I'm hungry for the subject. I feel like I got woke to all of this and, and ever since the floodgates it's just like i need more material and information and so let's just start with you mention in your book the other goddess mary magdalene that often depicted artistically magdalene is seen carrying a skull can you explain why that is well it is actually mary magdalene 
is portrayed uh, uh, carrying a skull or sometimes an egg, you know, and both of them have a very mystical uh, explanations or interpretations. So if you don't mind, I'll digress a little bit and I will tell you how I was on a really adventurous trip in Jerusalem many years ago with two archaeologists and they took me to the church of Mary Magdalene on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. It was a Eastern Orthodox church and very beautiful church. And I went there and the, for the very first time, I saw Mary Magdalene portrayed differently because originally I came from a Catholic background mm -hmm. and then Mary Magdalene is portrayed as a, you know, kind of a sinner, right? This woman, do not touch me woman kind of, right? So she's in a kind of penitential mode. And then in that church, I saw Mary Magdalene standing with her hand extended and you know, with an egg in her hand. And I explored this and I have learned that there's an old medieval um, interpretation which didn't really um, you know, make sense to me. I think it was just an interpretation for you know, the medieval mind, which basically says that Mary Magdalene after the crucifixion went to Rome to speak with the emperor uh, to prove to him that resurrection is possible and uh, he said i don't believe you and she said you know if resurrection is possible this egg will turn red and the egg turned red so this is the medieval story but i when i saw this image i thought this image reminds me of so many other images of other goddesses who stand there with their hand extended and they have an egg or a fruit in their head hand and what does it mean it usually means that I believe that they have some form of secret knowledge, different form of consciousness to us, which is more holistic, which is not so polarized. And we live in very much polarized times and our consciousness is polarized, right? It's good or bad, black and white, you know, this or that, masculine and feminine. So I look back into this lineage of the goddesses and I saw that, for example, in ancient Sumer, 4,500 years before us, there's this goddess Nimna, who is portrayed in the same way with her hand extended, and she extends that the gift of life and knowledge to humanity, you know, so that, that's very beautiful. And the same goddess Inanna, which is an Assyrian goddess, uh, Isis, you know, different portrayal Isis, and then Mary Magdalene, and all of them carry secret knowledge in the stories, but also are portals between dimensions or between death and life, mm. you know? So it's interesting. And all of them have to do something with resurrection. So for example, both Inanna and Isis resurrected. Uh, Inanna actually resurrected herself. Uh, uh, Isis resurrected her husband, uh, Osiris, very, you know, for a short time at least to conceive a child horse with him. And, you know, Mary Magdalene was there present at, you know, the moment of resurrection of Jesus. And if I just can say something more about it, because I'm really excited about it, because, you know, usually in the uh, regular Gospels, they, they say that when Jesus saw Mary Magdalene, he said, do not touch me, which in Latin means noli me tengere. And it sounds like, you know, rude, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and when you look into the original Greek, when, you know, the Bible was originally written, it's memo up to, which means you want, it's not going to believe, do not hold on to me because I have not ascended yet. Mm -hmm. So he was in the process of ascension, so to speak, right? So it's, so it's different. And, and she talks to him, Raboni, which is my beloved teacher. So it turns out to be a very tender moment. Right, like, and he says, "Do not hold on to me, because basically it would interrupt the process of ascension." And she so actually this, helped him ascend, isn't and that she, right? Like, she yeah, came she, from the temple of Isis and was uh, a priestess in the sex magic. And when they met, it was like, you know, that's fireworks. Right. That's right, and that's why I chose, you know, move away from kind of academic traditions and move to alternative traditions while using academic skills, you know, so some critical skills for this. And if you want me to continue in the same uh, stream of thought, she was connected to goddess Isis. And I will tell you how I found the possibility, how it worked. So it's yeah. not just a theory, right? So for example, I have learned because I wondered what happened to Mary Magdalene after the event of resurrection, 
right? So uh, I discovered that there was a group of philosophers in ancient Alexandria, and it was the center, intellectual center, like New York and London and Paris now, right? Then, and they accepted women philosophers and spiritually, you know, um, astute women. And then they had a collection, a connection with the Gnostic group called the Essenes in the Holy Land, with whom Jesus had connection and Mary Magdalene as well. So I thought, would it be interesting if she went there? So I started to look, you know, were there any women in Asian Alexandria that fit this uh, description of Mary Magdalene? And I discovered that in the first century Alexandria, there was a woman who came under three names, but it's the same woman, either Mary the Jewess or Mary the Alchemist, which specialized in spiritual alchemy, you know, specializing in ascension, or uh, Mary the Prophetess. And that she lived, you know, in the first century Alexandria, and we know it from another alchemist from the third century called Zosimus from Akmin in Egypt. And the reason why it is important that he was from Akmin, because the gospel of Mary Magdalene was also found in Akmin. Hmm. So I think there was already a tradition there, you know, and this group, you know, to which she belonged, were also called healers. And they got initiation from the Temple of Isis in Alexandria. So just, you know, make it sound like such a long story, but I just wanted to prove, you know, find the connection that it was actually very possible. So it's not just a story. Uh, there is a historical and philosophical connection there between Isis, Mary Magdalene and sexual alchemy. Right. So if people haven't heard before on the show, either to reiterate or certainly in your point of view and being a spiritual detective. So the real Mary Magdalene, like, I mean, because I, I pray to her now, to be honest, I talk to her all the time because I just felt like, I don't know, something woke up in me when I first read the truth about her. If, yeah, I feel like I was there. So I would be curious, can you describe who was the real Mary Magdalene? So I so there are a few sources and one of them are the Gnostic Gospels. So I, I don't know if I should explain more about it, but they were discovered in 1945 in Egypt, but they were written about the same time as the canonical Gospels, which means the Gospels which are actually included in the Bible, but they were not included in the Bible in the fourth century because they were considered too radical. And also in the 19th century, there was a gospel of Mary Magdalene that was found, you know, and but they were not translated for a long time and people didn't understand them. And in this gospels, Mary Magdalene is portrayed as a partner. And we don't know, you know, but close partner and sensual partner, because it's a Greek word koinoinos, which means a partner, you know, uh, including a sensual partner. And the, the main and most advanced disciple of Jesus. So, for example, in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, it is the disciples who come to her after Jesus' crucifixion and say, uh, Sister, tell us what the teacher told you that he did, didn't tell us. You know, give us the teachings. And it is the Peter, usually, you know, who is upset and he says, Why do you ask her? She's a woman, you know, how? right why do you even bother asking her the same happens in another gnostic source pistis sophia mm -hmm. when out of 42 questions in the source 39 were asked by mary magdalene to jesus and again peter says you know why do you bother even talking to this woman and jesus says peter leave her alone because she's infused with spirit you know, so she's portrayed as, you know, the most advanced disciples. And just to summarize, it is believed that she, she got the esoteric, most advanced teachings of Jesus, right? Yeah. And in a gospel of Philip, just to say, it, it, the disciples ask, uh, teacher, why do you love her more than us? All right? And also I said, Jesus often kissed her. Right. Mm -hmm. So if there is any kind of doubt about the fact whether they had a close relationship apart from her being a really advanced disciple, uh, then it is there, right there in the Gospels. Yeah, beautiful. The etymology for folks listening of Gnosticism is connected with the word to know. So Gnostics were people who claimed to know something special, for example, knowledge about a person or 
like a mystic with divine knowledge of certain key truths. So Joanna, can you tell us, what do you know about the Gnostics and why do you consider them rebel truth seekers? Yeah, I love Gnostics because I imagine them, you know, in kind of modern way, like they're in the ancient city of Alexandria and they have secret meet meetings and they discuss the matters of the soul and body because right from the, first of all, Gnostics have a long tradition that go be, before Christianity. It is now kind of discovered, you know, so they have, a, they have roots in ancient Egypt. And also they right from the beginning, they thought that the, the way that the, gospel, the teachings of Jesus uh, and I would say Mary Magdalene were interpreted were, was incorrect, that it was dogmatized right from the beginning. So it fits in into societal expectations, basically. So, uh, so just for your uh, you know, viewers and listeners, uh, there was a large number of gospels written by different disciples and uh, actually disciples of the disciples of Jesus and Mary Magdalene and only four were chosen in the fourth century so it took four centuries you know to collect them and say no this is too radical so this is too radical so they so they believe in gnosis which means basically the divine spark in us so basically divine consciousness is within you if you have to li live by your own spiritual experience you know, but you shouldn't take it from authorities and certainly no, not from any institutions, you know, what is your spiritual experience? You know, it is about your spiritual experience. It is, it is the inner knowledge. And it is really interesting because later when I got interested in a classical Tantra in esoteric Hinduism, which is obviously uses sexuality for the purpose of enlightenment or, or expansion of consciousness, you know, they, they teach exactly the same, you know, it's, it's they call it buddhi, which is the, the higher mind, you know, which is the divine spark within you, which you can access only individually through your own spiritual experience. I cannot hear you now. I cannot hear you now. Forgive me. <laughs> we had a plane going overhead and I had muted this and I didn't even know. So that was such a good thing I said. So I'll repeat it. I said uh, earlier on, you mentioned that in the West, the first goddess you came across is called Ninma and Ninma was the Sumerian mother goddess. And the Sumerians worshiped the Anunnaki. The Sumerians lived in Mesopotamia, uh, present day Iran and Iraq. And they were there from about 4,500 to 1,750 BC. And mm -hmm. so even though the Sumerians were an ancient civilization, their reign was marked by really impressive technological advancements, like they invented the plow, like uh, the first form of writing. And so what is your understanding of Ninma, the goddess, and her connection with the Anunnaki. How does that bridge? That's a very interesting question that I would like to uh, actually explore more in my further work. But at the moment, I come up with kind of three ideas, you know, but, but okay, the one idea about her, it is that perhaps she was one of the Anunnaki. Mm. You know, perhaps she was one of the Anunnaki because uh, she is, uh, the but the good Anunnaki because sometimes people have a you know perception that they were bad but from uh, we know so far were good and bad you know so she was the good one and she definitely wanted to give us you know some secret knowledge you know not only the knowledge of life which perhaps she helped us to evolve you know uh, and some people say that she even perhaps play with our DNA and I will tell you why and also uh, wanted us to evolve spiritually. The reason why, because I didn't explain it before, you know, anticipating perhaps uh, your question, it is that she's also portrayed with a, uh, with a kind of serpent behind her. Mm -hmm. 
which in usually in Gnosticism and in Tantra represents uh, the Kundalini energy, you know, the spiritual energy within our body. And some people feel it can also represent the uh, DNA helix, you know. So when it is this uh, serpent is moving up uh, upwards, it means that the spiritual energy is activated, you know, so she's fully um, she's fully enlightened and all she gathers this enlightenment you know gives this enlightenment to to humanity so she's definitely a benevolent goddess you know with a with a gift of i believe a spiritual evolution and perhaps even you know participated somehow in uh, upgrading us and our dna uh, also physiologically or biologically I know you talk about uh, bringing things a little more modern. You talk about in your book that most women don't have a full sense of their sensuality. Mm. So most of us, if we are to come to this, we tend to come to this later on in life. And that's a sad thing because I think especially in America, I don't know if it's so much true in other countries. You can verify this, but it's often at an age where we're all waking up and men stop noticing us and paying attention. Can you speak to that, that idea of having a full sense of our real sensuality, the gift that's really there inside of us? I think the gift is absolutely there. And, uh, and we just are told not to explore it. And I think it's not, it is some kind of systemic, you know, uh, attempt for women to repress their sensuality, which is very beautiful. It's not only life-giving, but as I learned also in esoteric Tantra is actually can lead to enlightenment. So I have this kind of conspiratorial, a little bit theory that someone we call it patriarchy, you know, although I don't like this term because it separates women from men. I, I mean like system, systematically, somebody didn't want women to explore their sexuality. That's why such beautiful figures, like for example, Mary Magdalene was called a prostitute. You know, when she was not a prostitute, you know, we know this nowadays, even the Catholic church admitted it, although just quietly, right? She actually knew how to use this beautiful sexual energy in a spiritual way. And the whole division between spirit and sexuality is completely unhealthy. And I think personally, we cannot evolve as human beings unless we are started to perceive our sexuality in a different way, you know, that we start to enjoy, consciously enjoy our sexuality. So it was such a relief to me when I, and you know, we can go into it if you want, right? From ancient Greece, you know, for example, goddess Aphrodite started as beautiful and sexy and everybody loves her and she's very powerful. And halfway through, you know, the works about her, she loses her power. Once she's in a relationship, she basically completely forgets who she is, right? And, and this is myth, right? This is just it, some myth is, perpetuated against women and therefore this goddess, Aphrodite. That's right, that's right. And she's the goddess, you know, who is the only one in the Western culture before Mary Magdalene, really, who is truly empowered sexually, you know, even Zeus, you know, the main Greek god is afraid because, you know, she's so powerful, so sexy, so beautiful, and so in her body, you know, in a beautiful way. And I discovered that in Hinduism, there's this very powerful, sexy goddess called Sundari. And she, she can move between dimensions and she is always portrayed in a very sexy way, you know, like Hindus often do, you know, beautiful breasts, you know, and beautiful legs. And, you know, she's so openly sexual. And when she, they say that her laughter was so se sensual that mango trees started to blossom and produce fruits spontaneously, <laughs> right? And she was a powerful goddess. And sometime around the same time when goddess Aphrodite started to mysteriously fall, you know, she started to be associated with, you know, like uh, with, with the loss of sexual power. You know, she now, for example, this kind of dubious massage parlors in India, India are called Sundaris. You understand? So she started to be degraded as well. Mm. So there is a historical movement that degrades this kind of powerful life embracing sexuality of women. And when, you know, just I mentioned that because I was, I'm not anymore, but I was brought up as a Catholic, as a little girl, I noticed this dichotomy right away because there's this Virgin Mary 
very beautiful figure, but you know, a virgin, you know, mother. So obviously com has to be completely asexual, right? Which is like, where did they come up with this right idea? <laughs> and then there's Mary Magdalene and you know, she's sexy, she's beautiful, she's smart, but she's bad, boy, she's bad. So you're told right from the beginning that there's something sinister about your sexuality. And what it created in human relationships between men and men is also very, hor it's horrible, you know, because I notice when I observe men and relationships of my friends, you know, that men also think this is a wife material, but you know, after children, I lose interest in her. It's very common because she becomes the mother, right? And then there's this other woman that is always enticing and interesting, but you really, you know, it's just something on the side. Yeah. right which is completely debilitating for our relationships so we as women and i think it's going to be good for men eventually we absolutely have to reclaim this the sexual life-giving joyful power of sexuality which is not only about motherhood motherhood is a beautiful thing but it's a stage right it's a stage in in, in a woman's development and the sexuality is, is very empowering. And in Tantra, it is the sexuality that actually female sexuality, not male sexuality, can I stress it? And I'm talking about Asian Tantric texts translated from Sanskrit that can, can when uh, properly used, lead to expansion of consciousness, of joining with the divine mind. And men are in awe of women in this Tantric rituals because they cannot get it without her. Mm -hmm. So the woman is the conductor, so to speak, of a spiritual energy that is sexual. And this energy during the sexual act spills on the man. And then he also can uh, experience this, uh, you know, union with a divine mind or cosmic consciousness, but not without a woman. Right. So, so what I hear you saying basically that spirituality and sexuality, yes, they can hopefully should be experienced as one that they were created for this avenue to the god goddess what i want to explore a little bit is what you learned about sex magic what you learned about uh, what happens in the temples anything we can apply to ourselves and our sexuality today mm. so what i have uh, so what i have learned uh basically that this whole tradition you know of, of sexuality was actually started you know as far as i know in india started by a woman arda triambaka you know who did uh, sexual rituals for expansion of consciousness and also there is a tradition of this in ancient egypt right there's a tradition of this from the temples of isis but even earlier than that so uh that's a very it's not Hmm. That's a very complex question because it's not exactly that there are certain things you can do right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? It is in a way that you have to. Um, it is a complex kind of it is a complex ritual that basically you have to believe you have to be ready for this. So you have to understand that spirituality and sexuality can be one. You have to use it. So this is quite interesting and it's kind of in contradiction what we Westerners often feel, it has to be used for expansion of consciousness and preferably in all of the sources, it is when you are not in a emotional in a relationship with your partner. So it is not about improving your sexual life, so to speak. It is that the purpose of this union is for the expansion of consciousness. Do you know but how long people were in the temple, were in their lessons, how long it took to progress and what it took to actually graduate or whatever they would call it back then. Okay. So for example, I'm initiated to one of the traditions, okay? So I'm initiated cool. to esoteric Tantra. So, uh, so it depends because it is the teacher who decides whether you're ready. So, you know, it is, they say, how long is the path? And the answer is, as long as your ignorance right so if you are ready then you're ready you know so it, it can take a year let's say maybe a few months but usually you know it, it can take uh, years you know so the traditional number is seven to twelve years wow 
Okay, so seven to 12 years. Having said so, so I don't want people to just give up. Doesn't mean you cannot uh, enjoy your sexuality, you know, consciously. But I, my experience, if you want me to share, of uh, expansion of consciousness through sexual act actually happens spontaneously. Right. So I believe, I believe- You write about that in your book and I was a little jealous. I've just <laughs> it amazing. It, yes, and you know what? So I, I treat it as an act of grace, right? Because I'm not mm -hmm. a tantric teacher, although you know there are great tantric teachers, and I can recommend someone. But uh, this, however, I was already initiated, and also I fulfilled certain criteria because I was reading, you know, chapter 29 of Kula Ritual, which describes it. So I was kind of imbued with the teachings, you know. But lots of people have spontaneous, without it, have spontaneous experiences like that. And lots of people have a reaction like that. They said, wow, right? <laughs> and I once had a woman, I was talking to one, and she says, I, I wouldn't mind just to have an orgasm, you know? <laughs> never, <laughs> never, never mind such a mind-blowing experience. But I think we are given this kind of experience so we know it is possible. You know, and I'm not going to pretend it didn't happen when I was in some kind of holy mood. You know, it was a very sexual encounter. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, I, I was already committed meditator. I studied the holy text, you know, from Tantra and so on. But in this moment, I was casually after serious relationship, I was just very casually dating someone. And it was a very sexual relationship. And this is when it happened. But when you think about it, this is what the Hindu scriptures say. You cannot be attached to the partner because it is not about relationship. There is too much emotional baggage. This hmm. is what they say. Although, yeah, devil's advocate. So Mary Magdalene and Yeshua were very much a committed couple. And they definitely practiced sacred sexuality together and a sacred relationship. And part of what she was doing with him was also with this sexuality assisting him so that he was able to move into his light body and be ready for when it was required that he do the ascension so that's, it. Mm -hmm. that's it that's absolutely but uh, uh, as i said in sometimes you know it is chosen that this couple is going to work on this together but having said so you can't it's not that you cannot have a relationship so thank you for this correction because mary magdalene and jesus are this example but the purpose was not to have a relationship they were in a relationship but it was it was for him and her to ascend for her to help him to ascend does it make sense it is not for them to to start a family necessarily uh, it does. I I just I've I just have heard otherwise, you know, about okay. like this amazing love. And of course, they did create a child. They did create mm -hmm. a family, Sarah and et cetera. And I and she also continued his teachings and her wisdom mm -hmm. um, out into the world. So, you know, really interesting. And that's a long time, seven to 12 years. <laughs> Although what a fun long time that would be. You know, what a fun long time. <laughs> But as I said, it can happen spontaneously. It happened spontaneously to me, you know, and with uh, with Sarah, it's an interesting story because mm -hmm. some people say that they, uh, the name of our chat was actually Tamar or Tomar. Oh, you know? really? And so it actually has some kind of biblical connotations as well and so on. And in, especially in the Middle Ages, people confuse sometimes two different people because Sarah is actually... And I'm, I'm not sure, I'm just saying my research, right? So they say that the real name was Tomar and they confuse it with Sarah, which is the black Madonna of the gypsies, you know, who, mm. who welcomed Mary Magdalene when she came to Southern France, mm. you know? So, but I know that Margaret Starbert in her famous book, you know, uh, about Mary Magdalene says that the child was Sarah. So I'm just saying that there are two traditions. One says that it was Sarah and one says that it was Tomar. Okay. And there is a, even church in Portugal mm. You know, and there's a place called Tamar, you know, and apparently it is after the child of Mary Magdalene and Jesus. Oh, name. cool factoid. I never heard that before. So I love this conversation about Tantra. I find it fascinating. So where does that Tantra specifically, where does that fit with your understanding of sexuality as a spiritual example? Um, so in your book, you refer to one specific tradition started by a woman who you also say was corrupt and you also say was hijacked. Can you tie that together? Yes. So this woman, her name was Arda Triambaka and according to the myth, you know, although this is historical person, she was a daughter of the 
three original sages that came out from divine consciousness. And she started this lineage of esoteric Tantra in Hinduism when the use of sexuality for purpose of uh, uh, expansion of human consciousness. And I just want to say that what you said is true. You know, I'm just talking about one particular tradition that I explored. So, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, expert on every type of uh, sexuality and spirituality. So I'm just talking about my research. So. So this, she started this tradition, which was then passed on orally with trans because women were not allowed education. And then also to preserve this knowledge from one yogini or dakini to another. You know, dakini is from Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, esoteric tradition. And, and this women, you know, carried this deep philosophical and spiritual tradition and passed it on, you know, because it was a matriarchal lineage from woman to a woman. But in the 10th century, it was actually written down by a male philosopher, Abhinava Gupta, who uh, invited women to his court. You know, he had women mathematicians and philosophers and prophets, you know, and he wrote down this tradition in his work, you know, Tantra Loka, which is the light of, uh, on Tantras. And this is how we know about it, you know, because before it was just transmitted uh, orally. However, once it was written down and got out of women's hands, it was then very often and continues to be, I'm sorry to say so, hijacked by the different gurus and some of them very famous spiritual teachers who now, because a woman is absolutely needed for this ascension, right? Because a woman is the conduit. So they are using women for their own spiritual enlightenment and then they discard them. And there are lots of stories up to modern day. And unfortunately, I witnessed it itself, although I was not involved, when actually some very famous gurus do it. You know, so they use women and- So completely disposable. They've served their oh, purpose, irrelevant, done, next. Yes, yes. And I've heard some horrible stories because then, you know, it's quite interesting because you are, this is how I imagine it from my experience, although fortunately I was not a victim of anything like that. You know, you are creating this, you know, this, this ritual uh, with, this, with your spiritual teacher, you know, and you have this experience of, uh, you know, ascension, you come down eventually, but really, you know, you're one with the divine consciousness. And, and then basically this didn't happen. You know, when you come down out of this and you are just a tool, right? So uh, there are lots of women who I know who are now in this situation because, uh, you know, they were simply used, right? So I would say we, again, as women, we really have to claim our sexuality and honor this, you know, we, that we have to stop being used, you know, because it is really, it empowers us to, to set these boundaries. You know, I am this like, I have this meditation in, in the other goddess. I am a goddess Sundari, you know, imagine it, you know, imagine yourself as goddess Sundari, this full on sexual, totally you authentic being because each of us is different, right? Yeah. And carry this, embody this. Don't just give it away to anyone and don't definitely be used because some guy can get enlightenment because of this. So we have to start with honoring ourselves and our own sexuality first. And we have to put boundaries because there is something like un unconditional love, but that doesn't have to include our sexuality. We are in possession of our sexuality. Right? Totally. We oh. have this gift. Yeah. You, you talk about something in your book that was like, I haven't heard of this before, not in this form anyway. So let's go there about drinking each other's genital fluids. I think I'm saying it right to revitalize yeah. oneself. Um, your lover's sexual fluids and tasting the fluids from mouth to mouth. I'm curious about that. What, yes. why, why do people do that? And does it really revitalize? It's actually not necessarily to revitalize. This part of Tantra is talking about it simply because to honor, to fully accept your body and your partner's body you know and also it's kind of to break the rules because they say you know all there are all of us rules about sexuality about our bodies and it's all always put in the disgusting terms when in fact it's a divine creation it's created for enjoyment and for our ascension and for our enlightenment so it's almost they mixed actually so it's and also gnostics some gnostics did it too 
you know so it's not only not only in india so they mix for example sexual blood menstrual blood with wine and it's like honoring your womanhood completely you know like you're the goddess everything about you is divine right and you know there's also lots of oral sex because tasting each other's sexual uh, fluids it is like the origination of life it's like getting back uh, in touch back uh, back in touch with the creation of the universe you know and that is beautiful and you're anointing your bodies, you know, when you say mantras with, with, with uh, fragrant oils and so on. And at the end in my book, I have this prayer that the man gives, you know, I honor you as goddess Shakti, you know, like that you, and it's just so beautiful. It's just complete acceptance of our embodiment because we are always shamed and especially women, you know, about our bodies, like in most institutional religions for the longest time like menstruating was like the worst thing you had to like you were not allowed to the temple or to a church or you know like uh, even in, in pagan societies you had to be somewhere you know at the edge of a village and so on and this is like i completely embrace your divinity as a goddess you know as as a human as a as, as a woman i'm sorry you know so and and so it's uh, the ritual it is i honor this that's beautiful mm -hmm. It is beautiful. That's interesting. That's really interesting. So a uh, spiritual alchemy and magic. Can mm -hmm. you explain more about high magic and spiritual alchemy? Okay. So they are actually in some ways, you know, very similar because uh, regular alchemy is basically transforming uh, metals into gold. When spiritual alchemy, it is what Mary Magdalene did with Jesus. Spiritual alchemy is whatever you do, basically, for your spiritual uh, evolution, right? But there are rituals and there are certain words that you can say. So, for example, that where we go that spiritual alchemy is higher magic, because there's a higher magic and lower magic. So, for example, in Wicca tradition and in most magical traditions, it's lower magic. Why? Because you use the elements, physical elements that are available to you to create something else, so to speak, right? So then there is a kind of cause and effect, which means there is a you create something and there's a price for it. So people who uh, practice magic, they say they got what they wanted, but there was a high price to pay for it, you know, because you play with, with the same energy. It's a kind of limiting, uh, you know, energy. When higher magic, you go straight to divine consciousness. So it is called para language. So it means you speak the language of the gods. Okay, which has immediate creation because you don't play with what is already available for you but you almost like go into the field of all possibilities and just create this, you know, we take it from there through your words. So there, like in my book, I have, you know, especially Isis was very good and, you know, uh, tradition of Isis, you know, so there are very few sentences that you have to say and you have to say them correctly, which basically you create from the field of all possibilities, not from what is already created right because then there is a price for it like everything in life there you go like oh this is like okay call it akashic records or future records you know or uh, the, the quantum field and you get it straight from there by using appropriate you know uh, incantations not not from you don't play with what is here that's a, that's that you know that's higher magic and it's called and in, in sanskrit it's called para which means the language of the gods and by the way, talking about the gods, this is what happens after sexual alchemy, after doing the Perfect. That's exactly what I was thinking. I'm glad you're going there. Because after sexual alchemy, you know, is, is when you do the ritual and it's different from erotic connection, if you want me to explain it later, it is in sexual alchemy, they actually, at the end, they say, when they say this prayer, he says, and now you will be walking like goddesses and gods on earth, you know, because you connected with divine consciousness, except in this way, you connect it through sexual act, mm. not through the use your, of, your, of your language, you know? And you mentioned, Barry, you mentioned Isis practicing this. Are there other historical women who practice this alchemical magic in ancient times? Yes, so for example, at least we know many of them, but the one that is most famous because she was also mentioned in Plato's dialogues, you know that she was actually 
uh, teaching Socrates. Her name is Diotima, you know, and she was basically teaching him sexual alchemy, you know, how to use eros, using like kind of Greek terminology, you know, for expansion of consciousness. And there were other women, for example, uh, many uh, of your listeners perhaps even learn in school about Pythagoras. I think yeah. this is Pythagoras, famous mathematician, but also known for sacred geometry and sacred numbers, you know. And his, uh, his teacher who taught him all of this was a Delphic um, uh, oracle called uh, uh, Themosticlia. Themo you know, so he has learned everything from him and he acknowledges this. And then he practiced it with his wife, Teano, you know, so his wife was his equal partner and he, she ran the school with him. And in fact, when he died, she continued to run and, uh, the school after him. But, you know, history, and this is when I talk about hijacking, systemic hijacking, you have to really look for these women because sometimes they're even called hetero, which means they were just prostitutes like Mary Magdalene. So every time a woman used sexual, I prefer alchemy than magic, right? Because magic has different levels to this. For the expansion of human species, she is systematically called prostitute or a harlot. You know, so somebody, I think, and I hope I do not sound too conspiratorial, but there are some powers that do not want us to use this, this beautiful energy for expansion for the betterment of human beings basically right because when women do it they're automatically called harlots or prostitutes throughout history even the so, goddesses are being demeaned yeah so it, in our today then is there a lineage of the goddess that is rising up or are we she coming back is there yeah. a, a new collective experience happening as absolutely, like look at the revival of Mary Magdalene. Everybody is hungry for more of Mary Magdalene, you know, and it's not the Mary Magdalene that is portrayed, you know, by, by regular religions, but the new Mary Magdalene that is actually more ancient Mary Magdalene that was repressed, you know. So it is almost like she's emerging back from my subconscious. Hmm. You know, collective subconscious. She's calling us. You know, she's she's saying enough. It's like the goddess says enough. And and in my in the other goddess, I say that she is, you know, one of the last. Although I'm pretty sure there are others. You know, comes from Nimna, comes from Inanna, from Isis, and then Mary Magdalene. But this is the same goddess. You know, and I don't know whether she reincarnated, embodied, or whether it's in our consciousness. You know but she's definitely coming back mm. and i think and i think that sexuality is a big part of this because how can we ascend when we reject the most integral part of our beings which is completely systematically degrade for us right you cannot even psychologically you cannot leave your shadow behind yeah right yeah. you have to integrate your shadow and it's not a shadow it's actually your light it's just portrayed as a shadow so I think that this lineage of goddesses represented in the revival of Mary Magdalene actually is telling us to develop this other form of consciousness, which is more holistic, you know, because we are all right now into technology, people want to go to Mars and, you know, fine. But this is this kind of, kind of mechanistic cause and effect intelligence, which has its limits. When all esoteric traditions talk about Gnosis, the divine spark, you know, about this unity of consciousness, which is full of life, which is joyful, which doesn't see differences, you know, in a positive, negative kind of way. And I call it goddess consciousness. And I think this lineage of goddesses that is emerging, they're calling upon us to do this. And one of the ways of doing is, it is to fully accept and embody our sexuality. Yay. And so with all this talk about the women, I become curious, what did you learn in all your spiritual detective work and academia work about men in the sense, how are men supposed to, if they were being trained or initiated, how should they be showing up for women as women, also sexually as well as non-sexually? What did you discover? I discovered to my surprise, you know, that men are extremely supportive of my work. And they say like, go Joanna, you have to do this because you know, men were always had more uh, sexual freedom that's given for 
for granted, right? They could do whatever they wanted when we were called harlots, right? But they also were not taught how to honor their sexuality, right? So they are struggling. They're just not very outspoken as per usual, you know, about it. So they are also struggling. They're also struggling from this division, you know, harlot and a mother. They also struggle with their own sexuality. So either they move to some kind of uh, weird stuff or, you know, uh, Zen Buddhism or, you know, like they design, move away from their sexuality, you know, into more aesthetic traditions. So they absolutely support, you know, support this kind of work. And they, it's mostly men who tell me, yeah, Joanna, bring back the goddess, you know, and they want, men naturally, like in Tantra, want to, you know, engage with this powerful, sexy woman. And, you know, but I think it's actually up to us. We have to wear women take responsibility for this you know take responsibility for this and show up as yeah. the goddess yes you know, hold on and treat but, a goddess like a goddess please <laughs> yeah treat a goddess like a much. goddess but be authentic about it each goddess is a different goddess it's not mm -hmm. about pretending it's not about being put on a pedestal like this is the goddess menstruates like this is what tantra you know all of these things right so this is it. And, and men are saying, oh, this is the best. You know, they are ready. And I think they actually kind of wait for us to claim our power. Somebody like me who I have not done Tantra, I would very much like to. I wouldn't even know where to start. I mean, do I Google Tantra? How would you recommend anybody who's listening and says, I would like that, but I want to be really clear that I'm going to an elevated place that I mean, obviously safety and all that, but that mm -hmm. it will actually produce a really powerful, wonderful kind of experience that somebody would desire. What would you mm -hmm. recommend? Okay, so there are many good uh, tantric teachers, you know, who, uh, and you know, but you have to be careful because some people call themselves tantric teachers and they really have no clue. But for example, I know one teacher, uh, she, her name is uh, Margot Anand, you know, who, who is very well trained, who was with spiritual teachers, uh, uh, you know, for a long time, and she's a renowned spiritual tantric teacher, right? So, uh, I, for example, I, 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 I would personally recommend her services, you know, because not everybody can study and so on, but there are lots of good tantric teachers, and she, she's probably the, the one that I would recommend. Where is she located? What country? I think she, she travels a lot. So I, I think she's actually, she's French, but she she's, I think also American citizen, if I'm correct. She spends lots of time in Bali and recently she was in Mexico, you know, so she 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 travels a lot, but she has a website, so you can look her up, uh, Margot Anand. Beautiful. Yeah, Margot, like with T at the end, uh, Anand. Uh, she's a French woman and, and, and spent many years doing this. So, so, so this is definitely one way, you know, of doing it, somebody with whom you trust. Right. Yes. And, 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 and I think that being a woman is also because you're not important because you know you're not going to be used by some uh, sleazy teacher, right? Yeah, it, it is important, absolutely. It is important, I've seen it and I'm still shocked. You know? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I know you write for academic publications on spiritual travel, which means you travel for spirituality. What kind of spiritual adventures do you go on? Where have you traveled? Could you name some places? Yeah, so one of my spiritual adventures was, for example, Jerusalem. It was a mind-blowing experience because there is definitely some kind of vortex there. I nearly went through this, I think, Jerusalem fever, I think it is called, when some people think they are prophets, you know, because there's strong energy. So, for example, an accountant or a dentist go to Jerusalem and they think they are prophets, you know, because it's just a spiritual energy is so powerful. So I was uh, walking around Jerusalem thinking, feeling this energy actually, you know, flowing through me. It's an amazing experience. It's just that this energy... So I'll just talk maybe about two different places because the spiritual energy in Jerusalem is extremely passionate. And I think the reason why perhaps it's just Joanna's comment, you know, maybe so much unrest in Jerusalem because there is so much powerful, passionate spiritual energy and it may be too much for humans to handle. Like I nearly lost it in Jerusalem. It was so powerful. Wow. You know, but, but I get- I've been there a lot because um, I have a lot of family in Israel. Yeah. 
But um, I was probably too young to have that. <laughs> yeah, and you so can, I you wasn't even aware ready. of energy back then, so that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, I think you have to be ready, right? And then another place it was when I went, for example, to Angkor Wat in um, in Cambodia, you know. But actually, not Angkor Wat, another Wat, because Wat is where like temples, you know, that were discovered uh, uh, there. And it was one temple, you know, just that nobody was there. It was just me and this guy on a motorcycle whom I paid to take me there in the middle of nowhere you know and and i had this experience of eternity complete there's a completely different energy because it's kind of hindu the uh, hindu temples which later became buddhist but mostly hindu and it was this this peaceful eternal energy and you have a complete realization that your eternal being and this is just a wild adventure and we are just all treating it a little bit too seriously, meaning you embodied here as an eternal being, and now you just got caught up and, you know, forgot that you was eternal being. But in this moment, you know, I had absolute realization, you know, that uh, I'm just visiting. And actually there was this kind of, uh, uh, out of a temple, there was this kind of field, empty field, rice fields. I didn't dare to go over it because at the time it was still like minefield you know, after Khmer Rouge. So I, I I just saw it and I saw so like, this part is eternity. I saw almost like a portal, you know, this is eternity. And here I am on this adventure and I forgot that I'm an eternal being and that we all are eternal beings. And this is just a adventure in embodiment, but it was just very quiet, not like, ah, like in Jerusalem, it was like, ah, you know, it was like, aha uh -huh. you know like hmm. peaceful sounds like peaceful and just now i know kind of energy wow beautiful last question in part three of the other goddess you investigate this notion that mary magdalene goes to france in her later years i actually have a colleague someone who's been on the show who channels mary magdalene by the mm -hmm. way who is right now in France because of this mm -hmm. very reason, researching. So elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. So there is a very strong tradition, which is even, I didn't know it, even supported by the Catholic Church in France. I was completely not aware of this, but I did research with the help of a French scholar, Veronique Fleyol, who, you know, there are records from the second century on, okay? So very, very early records that 15 years after the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene, Lazarus, Sidonius, which was one of the healed men by Jesus, and two, some other people were thrown into a boat, you know, as a punishment, because, you know, yeah, and, and uh, without sails, and hoping that, you know, uh, into the Mediterranean. Would perish at sea or something. They would just perish at sea, right. <laughs> But they were not perishing, you know, at sea. And in fact, just to let you know, if you ever sail Mediterranean Sea, it's very shallow and it's a really <laughs> very peaceful sail. So according to this tradition, Marie Magdalene and her companions arrived near Marseille in southern France. And there is this source called the Golden Legend, which was uh, written down in the 12th century, but it's based on chronicles from earlier times, which describe Mary Magdalene exactly, and it was written by a Dominican monk, you know, but it describes her exactly like the Gnostics describe her, which is basically this beautiful woman from a powerful family, family who is like a favorite disciple of Jesus, who is so eloquent, eloquent and who has so much spiritual knowledge when when they go on the shore you know she starts teaching and everybody is amazed by her teachings and then in this particular story that's why i remember we're talking about sarah and tamar that this gypsy shaman woman or gypsy queen who got a vision that this powerful woman is coming to the shores she comes up to the beach throws her coat you know to the so they can uh, safely you know go on a beach without getting wet you know and welcomes her and her name is Sarah so this is the gypsy, tra gypsy tradition and they still go to this place every year on May 24th in southern France all the gypsies from around the world there's a big celebration and it is the black Sarah or the gypsy black Madonna so this is their version of the event so and so that Mary Magdalene went there but because she was seeking in a not, you know, she she was already 
either enlightened or seeking inner knowledge, she was not interested in starting a church. So she went to a cave and meditated there for 30 years. And in this place still exists, you know, there are pilgrimages there. My friend Veronique Fleyol takes people there. And it is a place of great spiritual power. So this is one version of a story, you know, that what happened to Mary Magdalene there. And just to add to this, it was three or four years ago, National Geographic did a 3D kind of um, a representation of a skull in the church in southern France. I think it's Saint Maxime, because they claim that they have a skull of Mary Magdalene. And it is a skull indeed of a first century woman. So obviously we would never know, but you know, very possible because first century woman. And then they did a 3D kind of uh, version of it, how she would look like. And it shows this kind of Mediterranean looking woman, you know, like a 3D, you can find it on, on National Geographic somewhere on, on YouTube also, you know, how possibly she could believe assuming it was Mary Magdalene. So, and since then, there's this very strong tradition of Mary Magdalene and pilgrimages are to this day, you know? So some people think it started with Margaret Starbert who did fantastic job on this with her book, you know? But it actually has been going on since early middle ages and people in this region totally believe in this, you know? So, and in the Southern Western France, there was this group of uh, Cathars who also believed that Mary Magdalene was not only favorite disciple of Jesus, but his partner and his wife, right? So uh, all over France, especially Southern France, East or West, you know, there's a strong tradition. So I say there's definitely something into it, you know, mm -hmm. because they were not in contact with each other. You know, this one group in Eastern coast of France, Southern France and West coast, uh, uh, so definitely, you know, strong possibility. Amazing. Thank you. Thank so this you. is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams or goals? I am actually, you know, in a very beautiful uh, time of my life because I finished Via the Goddess. It was just published maybe two months ago. So I'm enjoying what I'm doing now with you. And I am completely open to the experience of life now, you know, what will happen next, you know? And I'm considering maybe I will write about goddess consciousness. Maybe I will write more about, you know, sexuality and spirituality in a more practical way because, you know, questions pop up like you just, right, ask and so on. But I don't know, I might say that I am like a newborn baby, you know, because I wanted to write this book so much. And now when I wrote it, I feel like I'm completely open, you know, so. What a beautiful open place to be. To a new adventure. Where all things are, pod, like you spoke about earlier, Isis, I, I'm reading here, Isis creating from high magic, um, all hash, oh my gosh, my poor handwriting, all possibilities that you were talking about the quantum field. So it sounds like yes. you have created this incredible spaciousness and capacity in yourself, in your life to invite all of that. So I look forward to seeing your next creations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you much. so much, Debbie. It was a great pleasure to be here. For me as well. And for folks who want to find out more about Dr. Joanna Kuyava, go to her website, J-O-A-N-N-A-K-U-J-A-W-A.com. And I end today's show with this quote from Lao Tzu. The essence of the universe is eternal. It is like an unfailing fountain of life, which flows forever in the vast and profound valley. It is called the primal female, the mysterious origin, the operation of the closing and the opening of the subtle gate of origin. Perform the subtle intercourse of the universe. The mystical intercourse brings forth all things from the unseen sphere into the realm of the manifest. The mystical intercourse of yin and yang is the root of universal life. Its creativity and effectiveness are boundless. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. If you are listening to the podcast and you'd like to see us, I welcome you to the YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com slash 
Debbie Dashinger, leave a comment. I read them all and gosh, I really appreciate you guys so much for being on the journey. Next week on the Dare to Dream show featured is Alan Steinfeld. Alan, who for 30 years has hosted and produced the weekly television series, New Realities in New York City. And with Alan's media appearances, lectures, and conferences, he informs millions about human potential, remote viewing, and the nature of alien contact. For over five years, Alan Steinfeld has emceed the largest UFO event in the country, Contact in the Desert. Please like this show, share it with your friends who you know will enjoy this conversation. And remember, honor yourself. What a beautiful place to begin to dare to dream. Thanks for joining us.